Okay, so as we all know, we're in Philippians chapter 3, and we are studying verses 20 and 21, and the uh, title that I gave this section of lessons for these two verses is, We Look for the Savior. So since it's summertime, I thought this, uh, this church sign would be apropos for today. Uh, it says, need a lifeguard? Ours walks on water. So I, I thought that was pretty good. Now today, uh, if you pay attention, and if your heart's desire is that you want to, uh, I can guarantee today that everybody here is going to get a golden nugget. You're going to learn something today that you did not know when you walked through the doors. I guarantee you. Okay? We look for the Savior. Philippians 3.20, 3.21. Uh, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. There is so much in those two verses that you're, we're, we're unpacking here. And what we started to do is, because there's so much in this verse, we split it up through the punctuation of it into the three sections of the verse. And the first section we talked about was our conversation is in heaven. And we learned about the proper wording in the King James Bible versus uh, in the Alexandrian text-based Bibles, the word is citizen. And we also learned uh, that conversation in this context and in all contexts of the 18 times it's mentioned in the New Testament, it refers to testimony. And it's a pretty heavy thought when you think about, even though we're on earth here, our testimony right now is in heaven. That's scary to think about. That's extremely scary to think about. Does everybody have a perfect testimony? No. No. But it's something that we keep in the back of our mind. For our conversation, our testimony is where? Not only here, but in heaven. And then we went on and we were looking at this verse, uh, this section of the verse, from whence we also look for the Savior. And we, we started last week and we said that we're going home. Uh, ever since uh, Christ ascended up in Acts chapter 1, we've been waiting for two, over 2,000 years for his return. And uh, we also said that uh, this is not referencing his second coming. This is referencing his calling out of the church. And we, we started last week and we said that those are two separate events. And we put together this little diagram here where we have the church age. Uh, how long is the church age? Who knows? Okay? It's called the, 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 the time of the Gentiles. Okay? It's going to end when the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled, according to Romans. Brother Frank? Uh, it's, there is actually no time associated with it. No, no. It's, it's just uh, it's the gap between the 69th and 70th week if you're a fan of Daniel, the book of Daniel. Okay? And then we're going to, when the church gets caught up, many people refer to that as the rapture. That's going to usher in a seven-year period of tribulation. First three and a half years are going to be basically pretty good. Uh, people are going to see, quote-unquote, world peace. They're going to see the Antichrist, and then things are going to come to a, uh, a screeching halt around three and a half years into it. And the last three and a half years are going to be tumultuous. And uh, that seven-year period, uh, God is preparing who for his second coming? The Jews. The Jews. Israel. Israel is going to be 
brought to a point that they're going to be surrounded by all world powers ready to be destroyed, annihilated for the final time according to uh, what man wants for them. And the only intervention that's possibly going to save them is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to come with his saints and he's going to do what? He's going to do war on them. He's going to do war. He's going to def def defeat all the armies of the world. And then he's going to usher in what we know as his thousand-year reign. Amen. Okay? And then at the end of the thousand-year reign, what's going to happen? Uh, in the beginning of the thousand-year reign, after Christ defeats all the armies, he goes and he grabs a hole of Satan, and where does he put him? In the pit. And he's there for how many years? A thousand years. But then he's loose for a season. What's he going to do for that season at the end of the thousand year period? What's he going to do? He's going to draw a ton of people with him for a final battle against God. After man has lived in complete righteousness for a thousand years with Jesus Christ as ruler, there's still, the wickedness in their heart is still set on rebellion. And if you want to know what's in their heart after the thousand years, go to Mark chapter 7. I believe it started at uh, verse 21. Right. It's no coincidence that there's 13 characteristics of a man's heart. Right. And not one of them is good. And so after that final battle, Satan is going to be thrown where? Lake of fire. Into the lake of fire. And then what's going to happen? Great the great white throne judgment. Everybody gets resurrected and brought in front of the great white throne judgment. And it's basically, you're going to get judged on what? Works. works. Your works. All those people that want to go to in front of God and do the balance thing, I got more good works than bad works, they're going to find out that if you just have one bad work, what's that mean? You're going to go into the lake of fire. And we also learned last, <clears throat> last week that God prepared a few places. He, and he made various beings. And we didn't talk about it too much, but there's different types of beings that Christ created. And he also prepared a place for them. Okay? He prepared heaven. And who's in heaven? What? The angels. Okay? What else is in heaven? What other beings are in heaven? Seraphims and cherubims. Okay? And then he created, uh, you could say the archangels, if you wanted to separate them out from the angels. That's Michael and Gabriel. Is Satan an archangel? Is Lucifer an archangel? No. Oh, he's actually what, Brother Frank? I think he was a cherubim. A cherubim. He was actually a cherub. Anointed cherub. Yeah. Okay. And then Christ created an, a, another another being. He per, he created earth, and he created some beings. What those beings were? Man. Human beings. Okay. And he breathed in them. They became a living soul. So in the scripture, it tells us for our final destinations that Christ prepared places. He prepared places for people that are saved where? In heaven. In heaven. Okay, and we talked a little bit about that. How do we know that we have a place prepared for us in heaven? He said so. <laughs> yeah, he said so. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Now, that's not part of this study. I'll let you study it out. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So, if you think you're getting a mansion, or you think you're getting a place in a mansion, that's something for you to study out. 
but he's prepared something. He also, repaired, he also prepared the lake of fire for two separate groups, or one individual in a separate group. Does anybody know? The devil and his angels. The devil and his angels. Nowhere else in scripture do we find that he's prepared any other place for the unsaved. Why? That's right. He wants all men to be saved. God's expectations are that every man and woman gets saved. Everybody comes to their senses and recognizes him and what he did through Jesus Christ for our salvation. So, he, has, he didn't prepare. If he prepared a place, then I would think that would be a very unfair and unjust God. Because his expectation would be, well, I'm going to create you, but I expect you to fail. What did he expect us from us? To succeed. To succeed to salvation. That's what his expectation was. Or is. So he has no other place to send the people at the white throne judgment that do not have their names where? In the book of life. Okay? So, it's really not a judgment. It's really your sentencing. And if your name is not in the book of life, where do you go? You're cast in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. That's the only place he can put you. Can he bring you into heaven? No. No. Because no. of what? Sin. Because of corruption. All right. So we talked a little bit about that. We know that this was the proper order because we looked at uh, Isaiah. And Isaiah 26, 19, 20, and 21, it gives us the chronological order of what those events are. So I know some people study pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, uh, at his second coming, uh, when is he going to call out the church? This tells us right here, okay? Then we started to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. And we started with this. It was a little paragraph sign. Does anybody know what the formal name of this little symbol is? So here it is. So this is guaranteed. Here's your nugget. Because I didn't know anything about this. It's pretty fascinating. That is actually called a pilpro. It's a paragraph mark. So what we found, what we discovered last week when I started to introduce this as when I do, when I do study, I, I, I do my uh, context or whatever, my paragraph. And so I asked everybody here in attendance last week, does everybody have this little mark next to, it would be actually next to the 13, and, and be, between the 13 and the B is actually where it would be. And how many people in a raise of hands had a little P, or backwards P, next to that? We have one. I have one, so that's two. Brother Frank, are you raising your hand? Or? There's one in the Bible you have at home. Okay. All right. So we only have two that have the P or the, or the Pilpro. Let's call it what the Pilpro is. Okay. By a raise of hands, who has a, in their Bible right now doesn't have any, any Pilpro listed in there? Everybody else. Brother Jim, do you have it? I'm searching. I don't see anything. Okay. All right. Wow. So we have a problem with the King James Bible, huh? <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay. Let's go to Acts chapter 20, verse 36. I'll write this down. I've got a pill pro there. <laughs> really? Acts. 
2036. Who's got it? I do. By a raise of hands, who has that pilk row there? <coughs> no pilk row. Okay. So it's not unanimous. Everybody doesn't have a pilk row? Okay, so if you keep your finger on Acts 2036 and a uh, finger in 1 Thessalonians 413, if you do not have a pilpro, do you have, is that verse started off with an indention that would start a paragraph? Yes. Yes? You're either going to have the pilpro or you're going to have the beginning of a paragraph. How do we know in our English lessons from third grade, how do we know what starts a paragraph? What do you got to do? You got to indent it, remember? Oh my goodness. If my third grade English teacher could have seen me now, she'd be so proud after I got that hard fought D. So. Okay? Now, what's the deal? Pilcro, no Pilcro, indent, no indent. Okay. Does anybody know when the King James Bible was published? 1611. In 1611, they published the King James Bible. Do you know who the printers were? There's three printers. Westminster? Those were where they were translated, and that's where they printed them. Those were the... Those were the and... Cambridge. Anybody ever hear of, or scratch their head wondering, what's a Cambridge Bible? What's an Oxford Bible? Well, you're going to learn today. See, there's your nugget. Okay, 1611. They, the translators translated. And by the way, we asked the question, somebody asked the question, where did the numberings come from? In other words, you know, Acts 20, you know, verse 36, or, you know, John 1, 3, what, the, the chapter and verse numbers. That started in the Geneva Bible. So when they translated the Geneva Bible, they inserted those. That was carried over into the King James, that numbering system. So there's one golden nugget for you. The, where did the numbering start? The numbering started in the Geneva Bible. And because we have a phenomenal resource here, I'm going to put Frank on the spot here and say the Geneva Bible, <clears throat> What was that Antioch or Alexandrian text-based? That was uh, Geneva Bible was at Alexandria. Alexandria? From my study, uh, it, it was Antioch-based scriptures. Uh, a text, I should say. Oh, the Antioch text? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. There was forerunners before the King James Bible, but we're not going to get that deep into it. So. Okay, so 1611. So that's where the numberings come from. 1611... Uh, it goes to the, uh, the translators translate it, it goes to the printers. Now, back, back in England, back in those days, anybody could not be a printer. You had to be, it, it had to be published from an approved source, an approved printer. Those approved printers, one was Oxford and one was Cambridge. Still today, uh, I think it's uh, Cambridge Press, right? Is still today. That's that's that dates back all the way back to this period or whatever. So, 
what somebody somewhere along the line noticed in the King James 1611 Bible that the last pilgrim used was in Acts 2036. So, uh, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, Brother Ed, I'd like you to read Acts 2036 to the end of the chapter. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should, not, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him in, unto the ship. Okay. Does anybody know the significance of that paragraph? Yes. Brother Frank? church was going to go through a specific group of individuals. You know anybody, anybody know who those individuals are? The apostles. Okay, and then when you read, you'll see that the apostles had visions. The apostles had uh, thought, that thought things in dreams. Okay, so if anybody's around today and they said that they had a vision that God wants them to do a certain thing, that is completely undoctrinal. That means that you're an apostle. And if you're an apostle, that means you've seen the risen Jesus Christ. That's one of the conditions. That's right. Very dangerous, dangerous, dangerous statement to make. Some people might make it out of ignorance. Some people might make it out of, uh, out of foreknowledge. But there's no apostles today. I have a question over here. Yeah. Uh, 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 there's a symbol here, and I'm, I can't see it too well. Can you tell me if that's a pope girl? Okay. Some sort of thing. Yeah, that's a pope girl right there. Yep. Yay. Hey, we got a third boat here. <laughs> okay. So, I don't know where we got off on. All right, so Paul finishes his his uh, ministry to the Gentiles. He has two more ministries to fulfill, going starting in Acts 21 to the end of the chapter. What's those two ministries that he's going to fulfill? Wh who, does Paul, who does Paul preach to and try to minister from Acts 21 to 28? Okay, three ministries, Gentiles, kings, nation of Israel. 
Okay? His next ministry started in Acts 21. and uh, When you start off in Acts 21 and continue out, who does Paul preach the gospel to? The nation of Israel. Remember, he gets, he, he goes into the temple and he gets arrested. And then he, then he asks to speak to who? To the nation of Israel. To the, the Sanhedrin, to the council, and to everybody that will listen in Israel. And after he goes through all that, does that complete his ministry of preaching to the nation of Israel. Okay, yes it does, Brother Alan. Okay. <laughs> then he gets an opportunity to preach, so they condemn him. Uh, they want him crucified. He appeals because he's a Roman citizen. And then what group of people does he then get to talk to? Kings. Right? Kings and princes and stuff. And he and so much so that he ends up all the way into Rome. And he's in front of who? King Agrippa. Well, that's the the past King Agrippa. That's back in Jerusalem. Yeah. That's back in Jerusalem. Up uh, the Caesar. So he gets to complete those three ministries. Now, why is that paragraph in Acts chapter 20, verse 36 to the end, so important? That seals the doctrines of salvation. The doctrines of salvation never have altered or changed after that. And in the beginning of Acts, all right, there's a transitional period. And one of the most dangerous doctrines going around now is uh, Acts what, 238, right? Yeah. That you need something to be saved. You need to physically do something to get saved. Baptism. You, yeah, baptism. That's, that's not the doctrine. Amen. So I got a study Bible. And so I'm trying to figure out, because in my Bible, I have pilgrims, and then in other Bibles, I don't have pilgrims. I have indents, and blah, 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 blah. So, and then Brother Ed calls me, did you call me Sunday night? Yes. And uh, so that started my quest on pilgrim knowledge. <laughs> okay, and as uh, my uh, wife could attest, I spent a little bit of time on this. Okay, so, the pilgrims. Let me read you what Brother Ruffman has in his, uh, I got his study Bible or whatever. Why the Pilgrims end in the 1611. Let's see, let me go back. Interesting thought here. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, verse 36. Uh, this is his commentary. Uh, and the reason why I, I picked this, there's another gentleman, too, that, that has similar thoughts and stuff. Uh, uh, the, way he, the, way, the way this is explained here, I think, is the clearer way. So that's why I'm reading it this way. What chapter in Acts? Uh, Acts 20, verse, 30, uh, uh, verse 36. The last paragraph mark in the Cambridge King James 1611 authorized Bible is here at this verse. No paragraph mark occurs further in chapters 21 through 28 or in any of the epistles. By doing so, the Holy Spirit has defied the Pauline message for every Gentile uh, believer in the church age. The quality of Paul's ministry, its contents, deliverance, and goals, aims, and authority end at, at verse 35. This is the pattern for every true Bible-believing Christian to follow, according to Paul himself. So, why there's no pilgrims? If you go online, you'll actually see, and you try to study this out, 
some people think that the printers ran out of pilgrims, and 2036 was the last one. Others think what basically was summarized. There's various different points uh, to this, but that's basically a good summary. So, what does that mean? How did we? How did I end up with a pilgrim in my King James Bible? in 2023, which I bought that probably in 2015 or whatever. Okay, so, in six, uh, 1679, Brother Frank, what happened? 1679? Yeah. And they also updated the spelling. If you were to read a King James 1611, uh, you'll, you would find it difficult to read because they used different letters for what, for what we, they used F's, I think for S's. Uh, There's all different types of lettering, Brother Frank. I have a page that was 1611. Yeah. It's tough to read, okay? So, in 1679, the spelling was updated as well. Everything else remained the same. Oxford did it, by the way. Oxford did that update. Yeah, Brother Frank? The people were trying to say that, that that was a revision. It was not a revision. No, it's just an update, yeah. Okay? Now, go along to... 1873. What happened in 1873? Cambridge put out an update. Oxford and Cambridge. Those were the two printers, by the way, and Westminster. was the third university that helped in the translations. Okay, so in 1873, Cambridge puts out an update. What did Cambridge do? Cambridge did two things, basically. They updated the spelling to what you have today. Everybody's spelling in their King James Bible is from 1873. They updated it into what we would consider the modern spelling. They also did something a little bit different. They put the scriptures in paragraph form. Although they did not add any pilgrims, those those uh, backward P's. What they did do is they put indentations for where the paragraphs start. Okay? This is an actual uh, copy or photo of the Cambridge 1873 King James Version Bible. And here what I have is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. That's the text that we started to try to talk about. And then also, remember I said that there uh, should be another pilgrim in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Okay? So I have 5, 12 to uh, verse, verse 21. If you will notice... And this is actual 1873 Bible. You will notice, what do you notice right there? There's an indentation. Same thing you'll notice there, there's an indentation. They put it in paragraph form. 
They did not add any pilgrims, though. The Bibles that we have today, depending on your publisher, will have, in this paragraph form from 1873, they will have either the 1611, the Pilgrims end at uh, Acts 20, 36, and for the rest of the Bible, you won't see any Pilgrims or any indentations. Okay, or 1873, you'll see uh, indentations. And then some publishers would add the Pilpro instead of the indentation. So if you have a King James Bible today that has Pilpros that say uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, th uh, 13 through 18 is... Is, is, is that a doctrinal error? No. It's just a symbol. It's either going to be an indentation or it's going to be a pilgrim. No doctrinal changes to anything. But a very, very interesting study. Were those in original manuscripts? Visual manuscripts, as I understand it, were in Greek, which is a totally different language, and we don't know what the paragraph forms were. So what's the significance of having them? The significance of the pilgrims? Yeah. Uh, it, it just depends on how much significance you want to put on it. I use the paragraph forms to get, to kind of limit myself on context. Let me elaborate on that statement, okay? As you know, when you go to start studying the scripture, do you ever get off, uh, do you find like a word or a phrase or a thought and then you're off to the races? Okay, I don't know about you, you, I do. Hence, why we're learning about pilgrims today, right? So, what I do, when, I, when we were doing that uh, uh, study on, on conversation in Philipp, uh, Philippians 3.20, right? When I want to get the referral text, uh, if I want to get the uh, reference text, uh, or, you know, what, what is the context, I take that paragraph. Because when, when you write a paragraph and then you start a new paragraph, why do you have to start a new paragraph? The thought changes. The thought changes. You want it to emphasize another thought. Mm -hmm. so, so one of my study habits is when I go to context for scripture, I read within the paragraph because I know the paragraph before and the paragraph after the writer is trying to emphasize a different point. That's my study habit. Now, some people will study the entire numbered chapter or maybe before and after, but at some point there's got to be a cutoff at least the way that I study. So that's so this is what brought this whole thing up was the context of 1 Thessalonians 4 13 through 18 and then 1 Thessalonians 5 1 through 11. There's two separate thoughts. 4 through 13, we'll get to it uh, but I'll summarize it right now. Uh, 4 13 through 18 talks about the catching up, the rapture. You flip to chapter 5, and it starts with a but. What's a but mean? Something else is coming. Yeah, something else is coming. And then it starts talking about the second coming. Two different thoughts. But kind of like the same subject about Christ's appearing. Okay, somebody raised a hand back there. Just one more question. Does that, having that, does that determine the authenticity of the Bible? The Bible is like, you know, a 
um, a good translation that the King James or is it, you know, does that have any significance in that matter? If I understand the question, the King James Bible, does it change it? Yeah, but does it, like, if you find a Bible that don't have murderers in it, does that mean anything? No, no, it doesn't mean a thing. It'd be, it'd be like the 1611. There's no indentations. There's, uh, the, the only thing that you have to go on would be the numbering that was carried over from the Geneva Bible. Thank you. Okay. So, it depends on what your study habits are. Now, did I buy my Bible because it had pilgrims? <laughs> no. I thought everybody had pilgrims. Just like when you were a kid, right? When you... When you went to school and you started, you know, you first started going to school in kindergarten and first grade and you start saying, well, you know, we do this at, you know, at home and we do that. Well, then you find out, wow, everybody don't do that, <laughs> right? Or, or oh, we don't do that, that type of stuff. It's things that you learn that you never know, okay? Brother Frank. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that the King James translation started in the fourth year of the seventh. Solomon's first temple was built, started in the fourth year of his reign, and was finished in the eleventh year. Amen. Absolutely. Seven years. So mm -hmm. that's not a coincidence. No. There's, there's something significant about that. So now you've got a little history on the book that you read. Okay? So uh, if you have, uh, if you don't have any indentations, not a problem. If you have an indentation, not a problem. If you have a pilgrim, not a problem. Okay? It's just simply, uh, the pilgrims were simply inserted based on the 1873 uh, uh, publication that put, put the scriptures in para paragraphs. And that's you, what you would see. If you were able to find an 1873 Bible and, you know, it was just freshly published. That's what you would see. Okay? All right. Any questions? All right. So we're going to give you back a little time because I'm not going to get into uh, what we'll start off next week is we'll actually get into the scripture and stuff. So, did everybody learn something today? Yes. Pilgrims. Pilgrims, right? Nuggets. Okay, there's your nugget. So, I, like I say, I came through on my guarantee. If you were paying attention, you were going to learn something today. Okay. All right, uh, Brother Frank, you want to close us in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time and teaching and learning. Lord, that you have English class, we just Thank you.